G'day, it's Carl Thompson here from StorageCraft. Thanks for coming along to this webinar today. So uh, I guess just as a, as a bit of an overview to um, start this off, what I wanted to um, sort of highlight is the, the product offerings that we have and how these all piece together. Um, this webinar today is specifically around ShadowSafe version 4. Um, ShadowSafe is our software only uh, software-based data protection solution. So this is our next generation uh, data protection. Everyone knows StorageCraft very well from you know, our, our Shadow Protect product range. Um, ShadowSafe is taking this in to another level, more scale around larger environments and, and some pretty cool new features. We're going to talk a lot about that today. The OneSafe Solo is basically an appliance version of ShadowSafe, so very much um, it's integrated into ShadowSafe, it has the same capabilities, the two can be used together. I'll obviously be honing in a bit on that because when we upgrade ShadowSafe to version 4, OneSafe Solo becomes version 4 of that capability as well. When we talk about the OneSafe hardware, so up the top uh, right here, this is a completely standalone uh, scale-out NAS product. So this is a great target for ShadowSafe backups. It can be a target for Shadow Protect backups. It can be a target for any backup product. It's a NAS. Uh, it can also be a file server. So we can integrate this into Active Directory. You can create shares on here. And the idea is when you've got these really large file servers, Rather than you know, hosting these file servers on your expensive SAN and then throwing a backup solution at it to try and back this stuff up, we can move that unstructured data onto the OneSafe. And the cool thing with the OneSafe is it's scale out. So we can add disks, we can keep adding nodes, and it just scales out that single pool of storage. So great for you know, your, your unstructured data as well as your backup. Uh, you know, that, that dual use case gives it the benefit. And one of the big things that's most relevant right now is the built-in CDP that OneSafe has. So what we do is all the shares, all the unstructured data, as well as your backup storage, we snapshot that every 90 seconds. It's immutable, so ransomware cannot corrupt these snapshots. You could have a 10 terabyte or 100 terabyte file share. You could have hundreds of terabytes of backup storage, for example. And if something goes wrong, we can instantly promote that share back to an hour ago, back to yesterday, instantly, hundreds of terabytes. So the ability to rapidly recover in the event of a problem. We don't have to sit there and spend hours trying to restore that data back through our backup solution. So very powerful. OneSafe, ShadowSafe, OneSafe Solo can all be managed in the same uh, dashboard. So we have a converged offering that, that joins these together, you know, or they can be used totally separate. And then with ShadowSafe and OneSafe Solo, you have uh, the ability to back up directly to the StorageCraft cloud services or replicate a copy of those backups to StorageCraft cloud services. So this is for disaster recovery as a service. This is included with the OneSafe Solo offering uh, and gives you the ability to virtualize in the StorageCraft cloud should you, know, you, you have a problem. Uh, OneSafe uh, Solo, as I mentioned, includes the cloud services. With ShadowSafe, you've got a bit more flexibility. You might say, look, I'd rather uh, send my backups to another remote site or to my partner data center. So ShadowSafe gives you a bit more flexibility, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll cover off the, uh, the capabilities and, and where you would choose which particular product. So looking a bit more into ShadowSafe, the, the big things that we're trying to achieve here is, is maintain the benefits, um, you know, and the, the, you know, what StorageCraft is really known for in Shadow Protect around the, li the reliable recovery, the flexible recovery, you know, physical to virtual type instant recovery uh, capabilities. Um, and, and then improve that. How can we make it less clicks? How can we make it faster? How can we get these VMs permanently recovered instantly? And that's what's really cool is the big difference in the instant boot uh, and permanent uh, restore, not, not a temporary recovery. Uh, also introduces agentless, so we don't have to install an agent into the VM. We can do it at a host level across VMware and obviously now Hyper-V with version 4. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's compatible with your existing disk-to-disk -disk infrastructure. So whether you've got existing NAN, SAS, uh, SAN storage, we can back up to that, or obviously you can integrate in with the, the OneSafe NAS. And the idea here is to really simplify it. We want to just really make sure we've got a policy that covers off the backup, the retention, the replication, that whole life cycle of your data protection, and simplify that into a policy that we can monitor, uh, and, and it covers the whole solution. So that's really what ShadowSafe is about to achieve. The whole product, ShadowSafe, OneSafe, Solo, 
OneSafe NAS can all be managed from one system. So this is a VM that you can deploy into your environment in a standalone environment. An MSP could deploy this into their environment and manage multiple customers from one system. Uh, and with version four, um, you can use the public uh, free storage craft hosted one system for ShadowSafe for OneSafe Solo. So we're, we're further simplifying as we go down this path of how do we get everything together into one place and simplify the management. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the policy. I'm going to take you through this in a demo, but the idea here, particularly when you're comparing to Shadow Protect, is that uh, you know in Shadow Protect you had your, your backup frequency, and Shadow Protect you then manage the retention out of Image Manager, and then you'd create a job for replications. We've put all of this together into one policy. We can apply that policy to any physical, virtual, host-based, agent-based backup, and we can standardize and, you know, this scales, uh, you know, and, and reduces the deployment time, which is really nice. The, the architecture is very different as well with ShadowSafe. Being all microservices allows us to scale using uh, this gRPC protocol, gives us a lot more flexibility, a lot more speed. We can really secure the communications between agents and the, and the storage and, you know, really isolate off that storage. You know, we can have the storage completely isolated from the network. Um, you know, and, and, and further protect that data from things like ransomware with this capability. But it has a lot of cool things. Um, one, one of the big things is the in-flight verification. So we know in real time, during a copy, during a write, if there's any issues, and, and we deal with that in real time. So that's at the heart of the architecture that's been used in ShadowSafe. In terms of a deployment, um, obviously I mentioned um, you can operate out of our free cloud host one system, or you can deploy one system into the custom environment for a standalone uh, install, or a partner could deploy their own one system as a VM. So very simple, we've got a tool that will create this for you and bring it up and it's all managed through a web browser. And then bringing on a site is simply uh, would be deploying a what's called a service node. So the service node is a uh, CentOS 7 VM. It's all pre-built for you. You basically install that into VMware or into Hyper-V uh, and that will spin up and start communicating to your one system. The service node can... Um, is basically responsible for scheduling the backups. Um, it's responsible for consolidation, retention locally, as well as handling the replication. And the first service node that you deploy is called the service leader. So the service leader is what's going to handle the communication to one system. It's also going to handle the communication to the storage. So that's where I talked about before. We can have the storage uh, connected directly to the service node. It doesn't need to be on the same network as where all the agents are running in, in the host space backups. So with Hyper-V, you have the option now on server 2016, 2019, or Windows 10 to do host-based backups of the Hyper-V machines. We don't have to install an agent. Of course, you may like to install an agent into some VMs, and I'll talk a little bit about why you may do that, uh, or, or then obviously on the physical servers. Uh, and, and that really gives you the capability. With the virtual boot for Hyper-V, the instant recovery or full restores, we support back to uh, 2012 R2. So 2012 R2, 2016, 2019, and Windows 10 can all do the instant recovery. If your Hyper-V is 2012 R2, you will obviously need to use the agent for backing up those VMs because it doesn't support the host space backup. So those are the components that come together with Hyper-V and with VMware. Uh, again, same thing, you've got the one system wherever you want to run that, uh, and then you'll have a service node at the site to control and schedule the backups. Um, with host-based backup in VMware, VMware have uh, transport methods. There's different types of host-based backups you can do. If the service node VM can see the storage, then we can do what's called a hot add transport mode. It supports more full backups at once, it's much faster. If you have a host that's got its own direct attached storage, for example, that isn't also running a service node, then it will fall back to LAN mode uh, transport. And that is throttled, it's a bit slower, you can't run as many at once. So, you know, best practice with VMware environments is you may have multiple service nodes deployed depending on your storage architecture. And then, of course, any agents on the VMs or physical servers um, as you require. So those are the pieces that come together. Again, uh, now with version four, you have the ability to leverage our free uh, cloud-hosted one system. So we've had uh, the cloud-hosted one system available for a little while now. This is what's required when you're using our OneSafe solo, um, but obviously with ShadowSafe now, it allows you to have one place, one login that you could be managing some customers on solo, others on uh, ShadowSafe. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, when I go through the rest of solo. But basically, you could have customers running Hyper-V, 
you may have some agents running, you may have physical agents, they could be backing up to some NAS storage, you could have another customer that's running a vSphere environment, again, may have agents, may not need to, you may have a customer uh, running Hyper-V that's, um, you know, you, you could say, look, this site, I don't want any local storage, and you can, in fact, back up directly to StorageCraft Cloud or directly back to the partner data center. You've got a lot of flexibility, and um, we also support standalone ESXi. Uh, if you go free ESXi, it's a bit, you do need to use agents to back that up. Um, you will also need to go through a little bit more of a process to uh, create the service node VM. Once you start going into essentials, licensing with the APIs, we have more capability in terms of deploying um, the service node VM uh, straight in there with a, with a nice simple tool. Uh, and you've also got the ability, uh, you know, with certain licensing to do things like host-based backup and then our uh, instant uh, virtual boot. So we can sort of go through those different environments as, as you need to learn more. Around the agent, this is the big thing, right? With Shadow Protect, um, you know, we've always sort of compared ourselves to host-based backup products and why the agent is better, and that still stands true today. The agent has our own built-in snapshot software provider, so ShadowSafe leverages very much similar architecture to Shadow Protect with the agent sector level. And, and the great thing here is you're kind of getting two benefits. One, we've got the StorageCraft built uh, software provider, so we'll talk to all of the VSS writers and have that in-guest uh, high level consistency, it's also at a sector level. So what it does is it tracks sectors in real time. So when you've got a really large VM, really large file server, it's going to deal with that a lot better by having an agent in there. And you know, a lot of host based backup products, even, even our own, we're reliant on VMware Hyper-V to do that snapshotting for us. And in, in scenarios where the host is under load or it's struggling, the agent's going to overcome that and deal with it a lot better. The other thing as well is, um, that you're getting at a sector level, so a lot smaller footprint uh, often with sector level backups, but the consistency. When you do a host-based backup, we will leverage the Hyper-V integration components or the VMware integration components to try and get that to run a VSS uh, snapshot and will report back and tell us is that backup consistent or a crash consistent backup, so we know you, it'll be reported back into one system exactly what's happened. But yeah, you'll really have a mix and match, particularly if you're running things like VSS Aware databases, applications, you know, Active Directory, Exchange, SQL, SharePoint, all those kinds of things, the agent is going to get a higher level consistent backup that gives you, you know, more reliability and, and you'll feel better about it when you go to recover knowing that you've got the best possible uh, consistent backup. When we look at the agent, there's a number of options. So when you start uh, installing the agent, if I take you through the process here, you'll choose initially, are you going to leverage our Cloud One system or have you deployed your own One system? So you'll basically choose that. The next step is what are you actually wanting to install? So for a new site or a new custom you're on, the first thing you need is a service node. So obviously on the Hyper-V host, you'll run this agent to install the service node. If it's running VMware, we've got a separate tool, which I'll show you next. So the service node is going to register that site to talk to one system. When you do this on the Hyper-V host, it'll create a VM, it'll download the VHDX from our uh, repository online, create the VM and turn it on for you, and it will start talking to one system. Along with installing the service node, when you select this option, on that host, it will also install the host space backup and restore APIs. So this option effectively does th these two together, so that, that host uh, will reg register itself into one system, we'll see all of those VMs and you have the option to immediately start backing them up. So these two options uh, don't require a reboot of the host. Again, if you do it on a 2012 R2, um, that'll be leveraged for virtual boot, 2016 and up, uh, including Windows 10, that can also do the host space backup. If you have additional Hyper-V hosts, you obviously don't need to install a service node on each of them. So you'll just need to install the host space backup and restore APIs on each additional Hyper-V host. Uh, they'll again all be connected into the one system and, and controlled by that service node for that site. Now if you've got any VMs or physical servers that you want to back up with the agent, that's where you'll just simply select the Windows backup agent. You'll just want to make sure that that site's got a service node running first, and then you'll install this into any VMware Hyper-V or any hypervisor or, or physical server to back up those VMs. And when you install the backup agent, it's going to ask you a couple of things, such as what is the agent registration token and the site ID. And these this information's uh, going to be in one system, which I'll show you through. So that, those are the options. That's how the agent comes together. 
from VMware, we have the deployment tool. This is quite a nice experience similar to deploying you know, a VCSA appliance, where basically you'll log into your vCenter or ESXi host, you'll then choose, uh, you know, if I'm using the Cloud One system, you can install a service node to be managed with the Cloud One system, you can deploy your own private One system, or a service node be managed by a private One system, or install the, uh, or upgrade the Vive filter. So the Vive filter is what requires um, VMware standard licensing or above. Um, the host must be in a cluster. This gives us the ability to instant boot, and I'll, I'll talk you through some of the, the really powerful benefits of that. If you don't have that capability uh, in Essentials Plus, um, it'll actually give the ability to initiate full restores through the API. Uh, if you're using free ESXi, you do have to use a bootable recovery environment, you know, similar, um, similar to a BMR basically to, to restore back into free ESXi. But yeah, where we've got the APIs available, we can initiate uh, full restores, uh, and then once we go into VMware standard licensing, we have the instant boot capability. With the instant boot, this slide here is, is very specific VMware, but works exactly the same with Hyper-V. Basically, when we click boot, it will, um, the, the hypervisor will talk directly to the storage, so, you know, such as the NAS or, or the OneSafe storage or, or even directly out of our cloud, as it talks to the backup and boots the VM at the same time as it reads data, it is writing into the primary storage. So there's no need for a secondary conversion, it's not a temporary recovery, it can transparently backfill the whole VM. And it's really smart, so it's going to read all of the stuff it needs first to boot the machine, to start the services, as users try and access stuff, it's going to go and pull that information first. But as it reads it, it's writing into the primary storage, and then as the backfill completes, the VM will be completely migrated permanently. So this can start booting in less than a second, um, it's got some smarts around um, reading that data first, and it works exactly the same way uh, in VMware and Hyper-V, which is really cool. In terms of a timeline, um, you know, ShadowSafe was released um, almost two years ago. Um, we've come through, uh, you know, a number of major releases. Um, back in May last year, uh, introduced our partial Hyper-V support, which is which included the virtual boot recovery, but you still had to use the agent to back up the VMs. So the big you know, feature here is the, the Hyper-V host-based support um, for Hyper-V. So where that's good again is, is where you might have VMs that you can't install an agent into to reboot right away. We can do a host-based backup. It might be an appliance VM or a Linux VM. We can host-based backup that. Uh, and then where we want to install the agent into the VM. So it's just really extending the capability to where you don't want to put an agent in or can't. Um, it has um, more documented support, uh, you know, and protection for ESXi, so that's where you're not running vCenter. I mean, it's something that has worked, but the, you know, a lot of the tools and deployment methods all specifically said vCenter. So we've made that more clear. Uh, it does need to be a licensed version of ESXi for a lot of the API stuff in terms of the deployment tool and the recovery, but there are options um, for free ESXi as well. Um, but also management from the cloud. So version four is the first release of ShadowSafe that you can now manage free from our public one system, which again can be the same place. You could have customers running the solo or the ShadowSafe in one place, uh, really giving us that unified management. And so to dig in a little bit more into the high level features of version four, again, host-based protection of Hyper-V, protection for standalone ESXi, Version 4 also includes data compression, so this is the first release where the software by default will start compressing the backups. So this is really nice, um, you know, before this the backups were raw data uh, and, and really relied or you wanted to look at storage that could dedupe and compress this. The way that ShadowSafe compresses this data can still be deduped. Uh, really well, the, the, the type of uh, way we write the data, um, so that you can get a lot of extended and, and global dedupe benefits by having, an, uh, having storage that can do that. Um, but, but this gives you some good savings, um, and it's really the compression logarithms are really built for speed of a backup and recovery, uh, and it is something that can be customised around different workloads. Um, you know, initially you'll, you'll want to go through support to get help through that, but there's a lot of adjustment in the types of compression that are available depending on what you're doing. Version 4 also includes a backup scheduler, uh, where you can actually choose the time of the backups when you start looking at daily, weekly, and monthly schedules. So this is a, you know, a lot of people asking for more control around when the backups run, and this is what is introduced. Uh, I talked about the public one system. 
Um, this also includes the ability to back up direct to cloud. So this was one of the things earlier this year when we launched OneSafe Solo, is it had the ability to back up direct to cloud, and that capability is, is part of ShadowSafe as well now, which is really cool. So with Hyper-V, it's not just host space backup, there's a whole number of components that come in. So obviously discovering all of the VMs that are there, the ability to host space backup or agent-based backup, the ability to have auto policy assignments. So as new VMs are created, we can automatically include them in a policy and start backing them up without you having to do anything. Um, you know, the ability to choose to do a full restore or a virtual boot restore. And some of those capabilities, those bottom two were already there um, from a previous release, but it's giving us that complete uh, you know, feature set that, that we had in, uh, have in VMware. So in terms of the solo, again, just like to covering off a little bit of this, it's all based on the shadow safe technology, but really turns us into a plug and play solution. So a lot of our MSPs, they want to standardize on something, customer might have different bits of, you know, hardware and software that comes together, and this allows them to standardize, but just it simplifies that really what has to, to come in, uh, you know, in terms of delivering a DR as a service solution. So compact appliance, all the capabilities of ShadowSafe, plug and play simplicity. It doesn't come with any storage. So again, this isn't a OneSafe NAS. This doesn't have any storage in it. The backups by default can go direct to storage craft cloud. Uh, and you know, it's designed to handle uh, up to 20 machines in a, in, a, in a single environment. So the OneSafe Solo, is a shadow safe service node that I talked about before. So you don't have to create a VM into Hyper-V or VMware, you can just plomp this device in. Um, you can pull out the bay and add a disk in if you want to for local storage. You can use a USB drive. And if you do either a local disk or USB drive, they're auto-provisioned and ready to go. There's, no, there's nothing else you have to do. Uh, you can also use a NAS storage. So if you want local storage, you've got a lot of options available to you. Uh, and then you can replicate a copy to Storage Craft Cloud. So the key thing with the Solo is each machine you back up will include a Storage Craft Cloud Services subscription for a copy of that machine in the cloud for the R in the cloud. Uh, and, and the same flexibility again is ShadowSafe, where this extends slightly is if you've got a site that's physical only. Obviously the challenge with ShadowSafe is it needs that service node VM running somewhere. Uh, so Solo obviously takes over that, that scenario. You could have customers running Hyper-V VMware, you can put a Solo in, it means you now don't have to you know, deploy a VM into that environment. So it can be uh, you know, not consuming any of their uh, resource and in their infrastructure from that perspective. So very uh, easy, and then you know you've got options around using disk um, attached in there. The customer doesn't have to have a NAS type storage for the backups. Um, but yeah, the simplicity is around you know contacting your disk. They can send the unit out to the customer directly. You plug it in; it'll auto register into the one system. You can then you know choose whether you're going to do host based or agent based backups whatever storage you want to use, and then apply a policy. So very simple uh, steps that you know, includes a full disaster recovery as a service. It again uses the same policy based management from one system that you would with ShadowSafe, uh, and you know, really just allows you to, to put this box in uh, and minimize the amount of things that have to be done uh, and skill set to get the solution deployed. In terms of the storage craft cloud, again, this is a key you know, benefit and, and is included with the solo and can also be used with ShadowSafe. So the key thing here is it's a purpose-built disaster recovery platform. It means that a lot of our partners that have traditionally built their own infrastructure and data centers for hosting VMs uh, or, or hosting backups and then giving them capabilities to virtualize is, is we enable them to leverage and resell the storage craft platform to do that. And it comes with a number of benefits. I mean, it's custom built for DR. It's a web-based, it's self-service. You can log in, instantly virtualize. It doesn't cost you anything to virtualize. You don't have to ring us to do it. You don't have to wait for hours for a recovery. So it's giving you the whole ability for virtualizing with all the networking components, public IPs, port forwarding, VPN to get the customer up and running right away. Now, there are a couple of service levels. The Cloud Basic is actually only available for Shadow Protect uh, customers. Uh, if you're using Shadow Safe, you can use Cloud Plus or Cloud Premium. So Cloud Plus gives you, you know, archival uh, and BMR capability out of our cloud. It also gives you the um, immediate file and folder recovery out of the cloud dashboard. And then premium, that is included with each machine you back up, particularly using Solo, that includes the virtualization, completely virtualizing 
uh, physical virtual machines in the cloud with all of the CPU memory, all of the networking, firewalling, etc., that you'd need for recovery, including the ability to migrate back on site when you're ready for, for a quick cutover. Um, so it's typical MSP um, is per per machine per month pricing. Each machine includes one terabyte of capacity. We pull it across the provider uh, and you get 30 days uh, of virtualization per year. So even if you tested it for an hour, each machine for an hour each month, that's only gonna take 12 hours off your 30 days of DR um, in the cloud and, and overnight BMR drive shipping um, you know, to, to assist with a fail back on site. Um, and the big thing is it's not just storage, right? It's, it's obviously a copy of the backups in the cloud, but it can include scalable compute for virtualizing at no additional cost, and it includes all of the, the firewalling. We've made this really easy, um, and you've got access into the, the, the PFSense firewall that gets virtualized if you need a more advanced control, uh, as well as patent virtual machine policy. So for your larger sites particularly, you can say, look, I want the domain controllers to boot first, get Active Directory up and running, and then give it a few minutes and then start booting other servers. And you basically schedule that whole boot process and one button click starts the firewall and then starts booting VMs with all the port forwarding, VPNs, um, you know, everything that you need set up ready to go to automate that. So really cool. Um, so yeah, basically, look, that, that's what I wanted to run through in the presentation. I think now's a good opportunity to, to take you uh, through a bit of a run through of the interface um, and, and, and take you through it. So again, um, sorry, I'm just going to bring over um, the screen here. So basically what I've got here uh, is, an, is an environment uh, connected to the onesystem.storagecraft.com. So this is the public one system. It's free to, to log in here and use this. Uh, and then basically, um, you know, depending on your licensing, if you're an MSP, you'll activate an MSP key and at the end of each month, it'll automatically look at how many machines have been backed up. Um, we don't care on the number of sites or the number of service nodes that are running, it's just how many machines have been backed up and then you'll, um, you know, you'll be billed through your distributor. So basically in here, this dashboard is telling me that all the components of ShadowSafe, including any solos, are all healthy. That means all my service nodes are running, they're communicating, there's no problem. It's telling me here there's 71 machines that we can see that either have agents installed or are host level VMs that we can see that are not being backed up. So I can get a very quick view at that. If there's a bunch of these that I don't want to back up, I can obviously go in and, and tell it to ignore them so I don't get that warning. But that's giving me a very quick view at what can we see that is not being protected. Uh, and then it's giving me a list here of six machines that I am backing up and that they're all okay. So just this morning there were three in red and they were running on my uh, VMware workstation back at home and, and they weren't turned on. So I could click on that and it just said communication error. So I've turned them on uh, so that it looked nice and green for you today. Um, and I can actually go and click on this and it's gonna take me right through into what are those machines that are healthy. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the idea here is if there's anything you're concerned about, you know, we can click on this. If there's an error here or I wanna protect these machines, I can click on this and it will take me straight to what the problem is and I can go and look at that. It's telling me about data usage, live change rate, system activity, throughput and so forth. So I get a lot of good information here on the screen. And for our MSPs, you can drill this down and say, look, I'm dealing with a particular customer, just show me the dashboard for that site. And I can click on that and now I can say, look, I've just got three machines running in my, my office in Auckland that uh, are all healthy. So that's really nice uh, you know, to, see, to drill down to see exactly what's going on. Now, in terms of getting up and running, the first thing uh, you'll want to do is go into configuration and create a site. So under sites, this will be a site, so you might call this you know, customer ABC, choose a time zone, uh, and it will create a site. And all it's doing is giving me a site ID. So that means at that site, the first thing I need to do is go and install a service node. I'm going to register it to that site ID. So that's a question you'll be asked during the install, what is the site ID for that site? Now, once I've created the site, the next step is to install a service node. So on the service node screen, it's found a couple and you can see they're all assigned to different sites. These are all called service leaders because they were the first service node installed into that site. If I had an additional one here in Sydney, uh, it, would, it would be another one with a tick, you know, uh, and it would just say service node. So the leader, again, is the one that is handling the replication. It's the one talking to the storage. So that could have an additional nick in it if you wanted to isolate the storage to a backup area network. Um, and that is talking, you know, SMB, iSCSI, NFS to that storage. 
uh, and all of the other communications handled uh, you know, using our gRPC protocol. So if you have a solo, you just click in here and go activate solo once it's plugged in and assign it to the site. Um, if it's, it's Hyper-V, you run the agent on the Hyper-V host and select install service node and then it will register in here. Uh, and with VMware, you run the deployment tool to deploy the service node into VMware. Um, once you have deployed the service node into Hyper-V, it will automatically install the Hyper-V host base agent on the host. Uh, and then it will obviously detect all of the VMs in here. Any additional Hyper-V servers at that site, again, you just install the, the host base backup and, and virtual boot capability. It will appear, it will tell us how many VMs are running. With VMware, once you've got the service node installed, you just come in here and click Add vCenter or ESXi Host. You'll authenticate to that, and then leveraging the service node at that site, it will go and confirm that it's got communication and then show you the number of VMs. So that's what the environments does, as well as any agents you install, it will appear here and tell us how many machines have been installed, how many are actually being backed up, and which site they're assigned to. So that's how that comes together. The next step is the storage. So we now need to start specifying what storage are we going to back up or replicate to. So if you're using a solo and you plug in a USB drive, this will automatically appear and it will assign it to the site because it knows that's the site that the solo's at. It's an external disk or if I plug in an internal uh, SATA drive, it will appear in here as local storage for that site in the solo. So those are automatically created. If I've got a NAS and I want to do like an NFS share, I come in and click Add Storage, NFS, iSCSI, SMB, uh, or StorageCraft Cloud for replicating to StorageCraft Cloud. I'll select NFS, choose the site, so that means that service node at that site is going to talk to the storage and then put in the path. If I want to replicate from one site to another, I just create a service node at the other site with a site name, add in the storage in here, and we'll handle the replication for you. That's driven out of the policy where one service node will automatically replicate to another service node, and that will drive it into the storage. So, you know, with Shadow Protect, you had to you know, download an FTP server, and you had to configure that and create users and so forth. So we've automated that entire process. It's much simpler. You just create two sites, a service node at each site. You choose the local storage for each site, and we can handle backing up directly from one site to another or replicating a copy. It's all handled within the solution, which is really simple, really nice, really easy. Once you've created the storage, the, the next step is just to go in and create a policy. So a policy is really how often do you want to back up? every 15 minutes, every hour, daily, weekly. And you can see once you start choosing daily, weekly, monthly, you can now configure the, the timing of when that's going to run um, versus you know, hourly, it's, it's going to run every hour during the day. And we'll automatically say, look, if you've got 20 VMs backing up, we're not going to back them up at the same time. It'll automatically spread them out over that hour window for you. And then you'll choose the destination. So what do you want to back up to? You want to back up directly to StorageCraft Cloud. You might want to back up to the USB drive in the solo. And each one tells me what site it's located at. So that's internal drive in the solo. That's an NFS uh, storage on a OneSafe. Um, so I can back up to that. So for um, for Sydney, my Sydney uh, lab in, in my Sydney office, that can back up to a OneSafe. I choose the retention of how long I want to keep the backups for locally. Um, if I was to back up directly to the cloud, you'll see here I don't set retention. That's driven out of the cloud portal. So for backup direct to cloud, the retention is handled by the cloud. For backing up locally, obviously you get the flexibility to have different retention here and, and then in the cloud. And then for replication, I can say, cool, I want to replicate to my data center, which is you know running something else, or or, um, or I could replicate to storage craft cloud, and I can choose to replicate hourly or daily. Um, and that starts to build a workflow. It's local to NFS and then a copy to the cloud. So that, that's how the policies come together. I've got a number of different policies here. You may have a policy for each site if you're using local storage. Uh, and then basically you just come into protection and assign the policy. So this policy can be assigned to any, any number of machines. So I could have machines that are, um, this one here is in a vCenter cluster. It's grayed out because it's not currently running. Uh, this is a green VM in vCenter that is running. I can tick that. And here's some Hyper-V VMs that are not currently turned on. So I can select all of these and assign a policy, um, you know, even a physical server. Um, I can assign a policy to that as well. So it doesn't, the one policy can be applied across any different number of machines, and that's the whole, you know, the data protection, the retention, the recovery. Um, if we take a look at a machine here, 
I can click on this, I can see uh, you know, a number of uh, information on this particular machine from the protection page. Um, I can see all of the backups that are available. This is doing host space backups, it's telling me that these backups are application consistent. So this machine's running, it's, even though it's called physical server, it's actually a Hyper-V VM, that's telling me it's used the Hyper-V integration tools to get an application consistent backup. So this one doesn't have the agent installed. If I was replicating this to another site, I would see it listed here and what recovery points are available from that site as well, which I can select and recover. Um, I can also click on jobs and I can see, you know, here's all my, my various backup jobs um, that, have, that have run for this machine. So from here, um, you know, obviously I can go back up now, right click, I could replicate now. This policy obviously doesn't have replication. I can remove the policy. Uh, I can view details on, on that machine. Uh, in terms of recovery, um, well, in fact, let me show you, uh, if I go back to, uh, sorry, protection. So let me show you just given version four. Um, I'm going to pick a Hyper-V machine. Um, I'm just going to pick something such as this one here. So there's a Hyper-V machine that's currently running. I can tick that and click Assign Policy. Um, I've got one here for to the Sydney One Safe, so I'm going to click Save. So assign a policy to that. You can hover over this and click back up now, otherwise it's going to run sometime within the next hour. But if I go ahead here and click back up now, I can see their backup queued successfully, uh, and we'll see uh, a status update uh, here shortly that you know says it's starting to take a snapshot of that VM. So see here where it says that last successful, so we'll see that uh, pop up here once it reports back that it's running. Uh, likewise, if I actually go and click into Hyper-V, I think I just saw it there now, creating snapshot. So in Hyper-V, if I go to that server, you can see Hyper-V calls it a checkpoint. It's now creating that checkpoint to take that back up and then obviously it will remove that afterwards. So that's going through that process. It's now uh, transferring the data from that backup um, to, to that storage. So that's how simple it is to get up and running. And I might say, cool, I'm going to start host base backup everything. And then maybe, you know, when I can schedule in some downtime with the customer, if I want to, I can go and install the agent and turn off this backup and, and have the backups running through the agent. And again, the agents will be identified with the, the little Windows icon saying it's a, a Windows agent that's installed and, and we want to back that up. Now, in terms of recovery, obviously all driven from one system as well, which is really nice. So you have the option here for a file recovery or a system recovery. Um, in fact, I've already selected a machine here previously. So if I go back to machine, this is showing me everything. So obviously I can filter it by site. Like I say, just show me. Nice just show me machines in Sydney. I can select, you know, here's this VM here, physical server recovery point. And whichever option I'm in, I can flick between system recovery or file recovery. So for example, for a system recovery, I can select a point in time, I can validate that it's application consistent. Recover from is optimal, so optimal is going to show me every recovery point. If I am replicating this to multiple sites, I could say just show me the backups that are available here, and it will just reduce it to what's available there. So when I click a recovery point, I now choose what I want to do. So if it's an agent recovery, you know, generally for a physical server or a free ESXi, you'll need to boot from the recovery ISO. That will automatically appear in here once it's registered, uh, and then we drive the recovery from here. Otherwise, for a virtual recovery, we choose the name of the VM. So I'm just going to call this. Uh, it, it, that was the original name of the VM. It's put dash recovery there. So I'm just going to put in here 29... 07 for the day and month, um, and then we choose what we want to recover to. So my vCenter in Sydney, um, my Hyper-V server in Sydney, so we'll look at Hyper-V today just given that that's the new uh, feature there. It's automatically detected that that VM had one CPU and four gig of memory, so it's put that back there for me. I can leave that or change that. It's detected that that VM was a Gen 1, so it set that to Gen 1. We're not currently doing a conversion, so this Gen 1 needs to match what that machine was. Uh, and it will do our best to auto-detect, but if you're having issues, you can manually say, no, that needs to be Gen 2. So if it's a Gen 1, that means that server was initially a, uh, a BIOS, uh, you know, MBR system drive. So it needs to be a Gen 1 in Hyper-V. And then I can choose here what I want to do. So with Virtual Boot, that's going to do the instant boot. I can optionally choose if I want to migrate the data or not. So I could say just boot it, this is just testing, or if I want it to be a permanent recovery, it will boot immediately, and then once it's started booting and, and it has nothing else, that it will continue backfilling the rest of all of the data. 
uh, if I untick virtual boot, that just becomes a full restore. So it will just restore everything, and then I can choose if we want it to power on right away or not. So for this example, I'll say, look, it's just a test on a virtual boot. I don't need to do the backfill. I just wanted to boot it up as a temporary VM to check it works, and then perhaps I'll delete it. So I click Next and click Recover. Now, uh, this works extremely quickly. What we have to do is our one system has to go and talk to the service node and tell Hyper-V to go and power on that VM, um, and then we'll see, um, in fact, it's, it's obviously happened here so quick it disappeared, but there's the VM that it's just created, 9.43 a.m. in Sydney, so literally, uh, happen I mean, if I go back here to completed jobs, just to show you um, what we did, if I hover over success, at 9.43 am, 25 split seconds is when I click go. Uh, within six split seconds, ShadowSafe had done what it needed to do. And, you know, it might have taken a second or two for Hyper-V to physically create the VM, give it the resource and actually turn it on. But it is extremely fast. You'll see the exact same performance of VMware. This is now instantly booting. Anything it reads from the backup, it is writing into the VHDX file. And then, so, you know, for example, the initial boot, yeah, it's going to be a little slow. It's reading off the backup, particularly if you did a virtual boot directly out of our cloud or from a remote site that had constraints on, you know, performance. But as it reads the data, it writes into the VHDX. So, for example, I reboot this VM, it's going to read that stuff locally. It's going to get, you know, it's going to be much quicker the second time around. But it, it's using its intelligent read ahead. It's finding the boot data first. It's then going to start reading the data to start up any services, applications. As users start connecting on and trying to open files, it's going to go and pull that down first. And then if I tick the, the migrate data drive, obviously it's going to start ramping up and pulling the rest of the data across to the point that it's completely migrated migrated this VM, there's nothing further I need to do. Now the one thing I will show you with Hyper-V is what we don't do by default is we don't touch the networking. So if this was a real DR, I would untick the button to say power on uh, so that I could come in here, add in the network adapter and assign it the network before turning it on and that way it's, it's going to boot up into the network. I will show you um, just while that's booting, just for your own reference, um, if I do the recovery again. Uh, choose, I can again, doesn't have to be the same recovery point, but I'll go and choose the same one here. If I chose VMware, we do have a couple of extra options. We will attach a network adapter and allow you to assign it to a network in that environment. Um, this feature will actually come into Hyper-V in, in one of our next releases. So at the moment, we don't have the ability in Hyper-V to, to allow you to pre-configure this, so that's something you'd want to add in before turning it on. The other cool thing we do in VMware is we allow you to keep the original MAC address, which means when the thing does turn on, Windows thinks it's the same network adapter and therefore will continue to have its same static IP. So these two features are going to be coming into Hyper-V. In, in the beta process, for any of you that did it, these options were actually showing there for the Hyper-V restore. They just haven't finished the rest of that development. So that, that will come and it'll be a bit more fully fledged in one of our future releases, which is really nice. But yeah, as I mentioned at the moment, when you do select a Hyper-V server, it doesn't have the networking option. So that is something you just need to bear in mind um, because obviously in Hyper-V, you can't go in and add in a network adapter while it's running. So, you know, you need to have that VM shut down, add in the network adapter, um, you know, to, to get that, that up and running. But as you can see, look, really simple. Uh, that's up and running. If it was on the network, uh, obviously it'll reappear as an agent that I can start backing up again or I can start backing that up as a host base VM to continue protecting it. But yeah, anything uh, this reads, it's writing it into the local VHDX. Uh, if I trigger the backfill, it will permanently migrate this. There's no further um, restore I need to do. And so, you know, again, comparing it to Shadow Protect, the virtual boot there is only a temporary virtual boot in Hyper-V, whereas this, because it can migrate the data, it can completely backfill that. But as you can see, very quick, very easy. This capability is available whether you're using Solo or Shadow Safe. We can instantly boot Windows 2012 R2, 2016, 2019, or Windows 10 um, to give you that instant recovery. You know, it doesn't matter how large this VM was, it's going to boot off the backup, and then the backfill can just happen over time. So that's how that uh, works. Uh, again, file recovery, come in here. Uh, I've already selected the machine recovery point, so it's, it's just going to jump me straight into the, the file system here. It's going to go and load up um, that particular recovery point because I haven't loaded this recovery point before. It does take a few seconds to go and pull that. This architecture works quite a bit different to Shadow Protect in that we're not uh, 
pulling through a whole backup chain. So it's much more scalable when you start talking a large number of machines. So this access is, is more like cold file access. So it does take a few seconds to load, but I can see the volume here of that system drive that this machine has, and I can go in and click folders, files, zip them up and download them straight in here. Uh, we have a feature coming, oops, sorry, uh, we had a feature coming uh, very soon in the next couple of months I think in the next major release that will actually also allow you to select a machine that's got the agent installed and mount that that backup as a, as a disk volume. Uh, kind of like Shadow Protect where it has the quick mount, we'll actually be able to drive that from here as well which will be really nice. Um, and, and that's really it, I mean there's a bunch of reporting in here around protection, SLA compliance, uh, capacity usage and stuff is, is all available um, for uh, monitoring um, the different backup workloads. Um, you've got ability um, under sites um, for um, scheduling reports. Um, we've got integration into ConnectWise Manage uh, for two-way ticketing. So if you're using ConnectWise Manage, if there's issues, it can automatically create a ticket. If that gets resolved, it can go away and close that ticket for you. Uh, and our next, uh, well, in fact, probably before our next major release, we'll actually be releasing uh, integration into ConnectWise Automate. Um, and then we're starting to look at some other RMM products as well. So th there's a number of uh, integrations that will, will start um, being configured from here. Um, but yeah, really that, that's what I wanted to run you through today. Um, have gone a little bit over the half an hour I thought I would. Um, so I'll take um, an opportunity now perhaps just to go and look at any questions um, that anyone has. Um, and happy to run you through that. So if there's something I've covered off quite quickly or you want to know more about, please um, put it into the questions now, otherwise um, if you need a shoot feel free to for take off and you will get a copy of the recording, um, but I'll just go and take a look now at the questions that have already come through. Um, can you talk about how ShadowSafe keeps track of changes in Hyper-V host based backup? I'm familiar with CBT from VMware, but not sure the equivalent of Hyper-V. So Hyper-V um, has the, the checkpoint feature, so we're using Hyper-V uh, APIs, look I'm not uh, I'm not too clued up on exactly how that works, to be frank with you, Joshua, um, that asked that question. Now, I know that the reason why host space backup in Hyper-V only starts from 2016 is that's when Hyper-V released their, uh, when Microsoft released the actual APIs to do that properly. So prior to 2016, other vendors that were doing host space backup had to write their own uh, version of CDP, I guess, to, to do that snapshotting. Uh, we're using the built-in Microsoft uh, APIs to, to do that and it's based off those checkpoints you saw, um, yeah, which, which is, sorry, your next question is it using the checkpoint, so that's exactly right. Um, Brendan's asked, is Hyper-V and vSphere the only supported environment? So um, it, it's, it's a tough question, so Hyper-V, um, yeah, I've talked about the operating systems there, vSphere, we do support standalone ESXi. Um, so that's where you're not running vSphere. We do also support free ESXi environments. It's just depending on the version or the licensing in VMware depends on what APIs we have access to to do things for you. So with the free ESXi, you have to manually import the service node VM. Um, you have to use agent-based backup. Once you go to Essentials and then Essentials Plus and then Standard, it opens up more and more features such as the APIs to do full restores, the APIs to use our automated deployment tool, uh, the APIs to do the instant boot uh, and so forth. So it does depend, our support site in the user guide has got a very good matrix that says what capabilities you'll have access to. If you're running other hypervisors, it's effectively very similar to free ESXi. You can install agent into any supported Windows VM. Uh, you can manually um, deploy a service node uh, into their hypervisor. Uh, your full restores will be limited to using the bootable ISO. Um, but again, it's all driven from one system. It's a nice experience. It's faster than the equivalent way of doing it with Shadow Protect, where it has to restore through a whole backup chain. We've got much smarter, quicker restore process. Um, but yeah, you, you are... Um, you are limited to the capabilities. You know, we will obviously over time look at KVM support and so forth and, and then look at, you know, virtual boot and, and, and the automatic deployment and stuff like that. So some more hypervisors will come on as we fully support them, but the capabilities are there now depending on what you need to do. Um, someone's asked, does the public one system site have failover? So um, look, the, the public one system that we provide is um, a highly scalable architecture, it's geo 
uh, and highly highly available and redundant in itself. So yes, we have a um, very sophisticated deployment there. You don't need to worry about backups of that data. Um, that, that system is entirely managed by StorageGraph for you. Um, with ShadowSafe, can you back up to a private cloud only to StorageCraft Cloud? So I did I did cover that off briefly. Um, yes, you can deploy a service node in, in your data center and have customers backing up or replicating to that storage. There's no problem with that at all. So ShadowSafe, you've got the flexibility. Uh, you also do with Solo. Solo, you can back up to data center or to another another site, um, but it does include the StorageCraft Cloud subscription. So generally, you'll, you'll be leveraging that for the DR, but you, you could replicate somewhere else as well. Um, cool. Uh, and yeah, and, and again, I, I have recorded this, uh, including the Q and A, and that will be um, sent out to everyone. So again, feel free to go and review that um, at any time. And I think that has covered most of the questions. So. Again, um, my name is Carl Thompson. Thank you very much for coming along to this webinar today. Um, we're really excited as we see, you know, a lot of these new features in ShadowSafe. You know, we've had some partners waiting for the compression option. We've had some partners waiting for host space backup of Hyper-V. Um, you know, or, or they, they're waiting to see the product more built out, or as it goes through a number of revisions so you know they, they were a bit reluctant on a version one and so forth so you know there's obviously been some bugs and things that we've we've resolved through the features and enhanced the product but you know as, as there's more features or functionality you'd like to see please let us know we feed it back to the product management team and, and get that in but there's you know been some major releases with big features that are coming through and a lot of capabilities and the solo has really simplified it for, for some of our partners and and we're seeing this you know a really exciting time now um, where you know we're starting to see a big shift of, of our existing partners with Shadow Protect wanting to adopt this new technology, um, or we you, you're using other technologies but don't have cloud-based DR with them, or don't have the flexibility or the simplicity or the instant recovery type capabilities. You know, there's a number of um, other vendors with similar products, but you know the options are limited. They can't recover straight back into Hyper-V or VMware as, as fast and as simple as what I showed you. Um, or, or their cloud is more restrictive, or they're more restrictive on the amount of storage, or the number of machines you can back up, or, or you have to, you know, develop your own cloud. You can't use a, uh, you know, a vendor cloud. So, look, we, we've got a lot of uh, solutions that really come together and meet, you know, the needs from a small customer to a large customer. That gives you the flexibility that you need to, to you know, standardize on a single product, which is really nice. So again, thanks uh, for coming to the webinar today. Um, you will get an email with the recording and um, sing out if there's any questions we can help you with. Cheers.